From everything I can tell, sleep is perhaps one of the most democratic, freely available, efficacious forms of, um, of health insurance that you could ever wish for. You make a very powerful case why sleep is the foundational pillar of health. I used to think that sleep may be the third pillar of good health alongside diet and exercise. But the more I sort of did my research and the more I read from other people, I realized I was probably wrong, that in fact sleep is the foundation on which those two other things sit. Um, and I'll give you an example in each. Firstly, for diet and exercise, we know that if people are trying to lose weight and they're being judicious about their food intake, they're trying to um, diet, but they're not getting sufficient sleep, 70% of all the weight that they lose will come from lean muscle mass and not fat. Wow. Because your body becomes very stingy in giving up its fat when you are underslept. So dieting becomes, you know, quite redundant in that regard. You know, you, you want to keep the muscle, you want to let go of the fat and sleep deprivation will do the opposite to you. So that's the first thing. It's a foundational element on which, you know, nutrition sits. We know that um, without sufficient sleep, two critical appetite hormones go in opposite bad directions. <laughs> One of those hormones is called leptin, which is a hormone that sort of signals to your body you're full, you're, you don't want to eat anymore. The other hormone is called ghrelin, which does the opposite. It says you're not satisfied with your food, you want to eat more. Um, and despite leptin and ghrelin sounding like two hobbits, they are actually real <laughs> hormones. Um, what's interesting is that when you sleep deprive people or even just limit them to maybe just like five or six hours of sleep for a week, levels of leptin, which say you're full, don't eat more, they drop down. Levels of ghrelin that ramp up your hunger and say, I've just eaten a big meal, but I'm not satisfied. I want to eat more. That hormone skyrockets when you're underslept. So no wonder people who are sleeping just five to six hours a night will actually eat on average somewhere between two to 300 extra calories every single day. Let me move over to activity. We've spoken about the foundation on which diet sits. When you are not sleeping sufficient amounts, firstly, the likelihood that you will actually exercise decreases significantly. Your motivation to be physically active drops away. Even if you are physically active, the intensity of your workout will not be as strong. So it's less effective and less efficient. Your things like your vertical jump height, your muscle contraction strength, even the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen in your respiratory systems, they get worse when you haven't slept. Wow. What's even more frightening, however, is that your risk for injury increases when you are exercising but not well slept. This is incredible. So there is yet another demonstration of how even if you're trying to be physically active but not getting sufficient sleep, it can be harmful. The beauty of that part of the relationship and the same for diet is that it's bi-directional, that if you actually you know, improve your sleep, you can improve those two things. But conversely, those two things will improve sleep. Yeah. So if you start to correct your diet, you start to sleep better. But physical activity is a great way to enhance both the quality and the quantity of your deep sleep. You know, I, I, I often say this when I'm teaching doctors, you know, why are we not bringing up sleep quality with pretty much every single patient that walks in through our door. Sleep really is the tide that raises all of the other health boats. It's the superordinate node that if you manipulate it, you know, it's like the Archimedes lever, you pull that, everything else, you know, can start to come into play. Yeah, the, you get the sleep better, it affects your brain, it affects your hormones, it affects your genetic expression, it affects yeah. all these sort of things that we might be looking for drugs to, to affect those individual pathways, but you can improve a lot of them by, by improving your sleep. Yeah, you know, and it's no, we, we think, well, that sounds almost too good, but don't forget, you know, it took Mother Nature 3.6 million years to evolve this necessity of eight hours of sleep in place, which I should note, by the way, that if you look at the data, back in the 1940s, the average adult was sleeping about uh, 7.9 hours of sleep. Now that number here in the United Kingdom is closer to six hours and 30 minutes. In other words, within the space of 100 years, which is a blink of an evolutionary eye, we've lopped off almost 20% of our sleep need. You know, how could that not come with demonstrable health and disease consequence? And all it takes is one hour of lost sleep. 
because there is a global experiment that's performed on 1.6 billion people across 70 countries twice a year, and it's called daylight savings time. <laughs> yeah. And it turns out that when you look at that data in the spring, when we lose an hour of sleep, we see a subsequent 24% increase in heart attacks as a result. It's just incredible. But in the that? autumn, you know, when we gain an hour of sleep, we see a 21% reduction in heart attacks. So, so the data is there on, on a global level. The data is, you know, it's striking, you know, and you can even think, you know, you speak a lot about, um, you know, the immune system. It's so key for our health. If you look at people who become infected or you actually infect them in the experimental laboratory, let's say with yeah. sort of a, a cold uh, vaccine, or um, you immediately trigger increased sleepiness and increased amounts of deep sleep. And it turns out that the infection indicates to the immune system that you're under attack and the immune system will actually signal to the sleep system within the brain we need more sleep. Sleep is the best battle force that we have right now to combat this assault. And so that's why when you're sick, all you tend to want to do is just curl up in bed and go to sleep. The reason is because your body is trying to sleep you well. It's an appropriate response to what's going on. Right? Exactly. It, so bodies are pretty clever, right? It, they are remarkably clever. You know, again, Mother Nature has figured this out. And so she brings up this thing called sleep, which I would argue is probably like the Swiss army knife of health. You know, whatever ailment you are facing, it is more than likely that sleep has a tool in the box to try and help fight it. That's so key. Whatever ailment you're facing, guys, if you listen to this, whatever you're suffering from, whether it's you know, a lack of energy on a day to day basis, or whether it's that you're worried about your risk of developing a chronic disease such as type 2 diabetes or heart problems as you get older, you know, what Matthew is saying, what Professor Walker is saying is that sleep, improving your quality of sleep is going to help you with all these different facets. It's going to help reduce your risk. It's going to help increase your energy. It's also going to reduce your risk of actually getting disease in the future, which is just absolutely incredible. From everything I can tell, sleep is perhaps one of the most democratic, freely available, efficacious forms of um, of health insurance that you could ever wish for. What are those common things that people aren't doing that they could do to help improve their sleep? The first is regularity. Um, going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time, no matter what, even if you've had a bad night of sleep, still try to wake up at the same time. The second thing is temperature. Keep your bedroom cool. Um, probably around about 18 degrees Celsius, which is colder than most people think. But cooling the room down takes your body into that right sort of thermal space for good sleep. It cools it down. We are, I think, a dark deprived society in this modern era. And you need darkness at night to allow the release of a hormone called melatonin, which helps time the healthy onset of your sleep. So yes, it's to do with blue light sort of emitting devices, screens, phones. Those are things that you should try and stay away from in the last hour before bed. But it's not just that. It's also overhead lighting. You know, we don't need to be bathed in electric light all night. In the last hour before bed, just try turning half of the lights off in your flat or in your home. You'd be surprised at how soporific and sleepy you become when you're shrouded in darkness. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing is, I would say, walk it out. And what I mean by that is, don't stay in bed if you've been awake for 20 or 25 minutes, either trying to fall asleep or you've woken up and you're trying to get back to sleep. The reason is because your brain is this wonderfully associative device and it will start to very quickly learn that being in bed is about being awake rather than asleep. So what you need to do is after about 25 minutes, just relax, understand that sleep is not quite here yet, go to a different room, in dim light, read a book or listen to a podcast. Only return to bed when you are very sleepy. And that way your brain will start to relearn the association that your bedroom is the place of sleep. Let's go into caffeine. I mean, how much of a sleep disruptor is caffeine? If you have a cup of coffee at noon, a quarter of that caffeine is still circulating around your brain at midnight. Wow. So to put that in context, it would be the equivalent of getting into bed and just before you turn the light out, you swig a quarter of a cup of Starbucks and you hope for a good night of sleep. 
it, you know, you would never do that because, yeah. you know, but that's exactly, unfortunately, what people do, you know, um, completely innocently by drinking caffeine, you know, still too late in the afternoon. I always try and get people sleeping as well as they've ever slept. Then they can start reintroducing some of these yeah. lifestyle things that they want. And they can say, oh, wow, that's interesting. I, I felt great last week, but now when I have a 2 p.m. coffee, you know what, I'm not quite as good. Okay, that's that's going to teach me now that I, I'm going to I'm gonna knock it a, a bit earlier in the day because I think ultimately nobody's going to follow your advice or my advice simply because we told them to. I think it's only when they start to feel the difference themselves, yeah. they go, wow, you know, I kind of like feeling good. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do think about one thing that you can take and apply into your life. Inspiration is not enough, you need to take action. If you did enjoy that, please do press subscribe, hit that notification bell, and why not check out this conversation that I picked out that acts as the perfect follow-up.